Dave Anderson here with the Fisherman Magazine, and this week we've got big news for black fishermen in Rhode Island. We're also hearing about holdover striper action lighting up throughout the region, and the stocking trucks are now on the roll in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Stay tuned for all that and more on this week's New England Fishing Forecast. The Fishing News is sponsored by these fine partners. So before we get started, I want to talk about what happened in Rhode Island this week for black fishermen. Uh, there was a meeting and a vote, and basically, I mean, I think the easiest way to say it is the tides are changing. Um, regulations are going to change. I think it's a positive change. Um, but I sat down today with Greg Vespi from RISA, and he's going to give us a full breakdown of what happened at the meeting and what it means for Rhode Island anglers. So here we are with Greg Vespi from Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers, and he's going to give us a little rundown of what's going on and what went on at the uh, TOG meeting this week. So just tell me a little bit about the, um, the resolution that went through and how the meeting went. So the uh, Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers in kind of in formed a coalition of our members, some local charter captains, even a head boat, and we put forward a proposal to try to protect Rhode Island's tautology a bit. We have had some concern that the fishery has really taken a beating the last couple of years. And yet it's, we think, the best tog fishery on the East Coast. It's just what Rhode Island has been able to um, produce over the last few years is truly unbelievable. There's such a, a special mix of year class fish, everything from you know two to three pounders to, to 20 pounds of tog. We had two 20 pounders in one day caught last year. Um, yeah. So we wanted to try to take some steps to protect that, Dave, because it, it's it's um, just such a special fishery and it took so long to get us here to, to yeah. this stage, you know, as slow as they grow. Um, this has been a 15, 20 year evolution to get the fishery where it is. And so, what so we put this proposal to, to um, limit folks to one trophy tog a day out of their bag limit. And then also in the fall, when the bag limit increases to knock the increase to four instead of five tog a day in the fall. So it not major changes, but it was enough that we thought would start to help, would yep. kind of help preserve the, the trophy fishery, especially. Um, yep. As you know, some of the good captains, once you get good at tog fishing and once you, you, you get that art down, it's one of the most consistent fish there is. They're going to be there. Now, they don't always feed the same amount every day, but they're there. It's not like, like once you find them and you know where they're at, the good captains can sit on them. And they're the same ones, thankfully, that want to preserve and protect these big trophy fish because that's what's driving the fishery. That's what's bringing folks into the state to come fish is these chances to catch a 12, 14, you know, 20 pound blackfish. Absolutely. So, so that was neat. So we got together and we formed this proposal and it made its way to the council last night for a vote. It wound through the workshops and the hearings. And it was uh, quite a night. There was a, another proposal at first that hit the deck right away as soon as the meeting started. And we almost thought that was going to be that. Mm -hmm. um, but with a little bit of maneuvering, there was able to open up for some, some commentary. And we, we reinforced just how important this fishery was to, to Rhode Island. Um, and that we had a bunch of not just recreational fishermen, but you know, captains and other folks, tackle shops joined in. And just this is what's driving the fall economy, the fishing economy in Rhode Island now in the yeah. fall. So it was really neat. And we asked the council to, to please, you know, he, be open and to, to consider being proactive and not waiting until there's an actual mandate that says we have to cut. Yep. And anyway, that took place. And then they did have the vote on the proposal, which was status quo, which pretty much right. Every state always, there's always an option. Don't, don't do anything. Right. Uh, unless you're totally mandated to have to do something status quo is pretty much always, you know, going to be there. And so it was there for us and it did not pass. And a few minutes later, our proposal was put on the table and brought to brought to a vote and it passed four to two. Yeah. And we're just tickled pink. It's, um, it, you know, it's not a done deal. That, that council then forwards the recommendation to the head of Rhode Island DEM. And then I guess that ends up going to the governor technically. And then it's, you know, he approves it anyway. And then it goes to the Mid-Atlantic Council, I think for final. Um, I think I was talking to you about it earlier. There's a little 
we had to nuance this a little bit because Rhode Island is locked into Massachusetts with Tatog. So if you make too big of a change, that actually brings Massachusetts into it and they have the ability to say, hey, we don't want to do that. And, you know, it, it just, so while some folks might say, well, that's not much of a change what you did, we had to limit it somewhat, both based on the way the rules are set up that we didn't want to offend Massachusetts or cause them to get involved. Um, and then on that, we also didn't want to do so much that we lost part of our coalition. Like we, we had yeah. to put together kind of a broad base um, group that supported it. And as you know, that fishing, that's never easy to get folks to agree no. on almost anything in fishing. So we're Absolutely. really proud of what we could do. And it, it went through and um, we're really hopeful that it, it starts to make a difference. And uh, we think it's a step in the right direction of recognizing just how special this fishery is. No, I agree. And so just to reiterate, uh, basically it's the only effect it has on the bulk of the season is that you're going to, um, you, you're only going to be able to keep one fish over 21 inches. That That's the trophy. Uh, Correct. Dedica Which should, uh, designation. should come out eight, 10 pounds, depending on how yeah. fat, you know, how fat yeah. the fish is. I mean, it's a good size tog. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, um, and then in the fall, you just, instead of keeping your five, you're keeping your four. And, you know, I mean, we talked about it earlier, but I, I think it's a great move, you know, slow growing fish. It's basically, you know, should be the state fish of Rhode Island. And, um, you know, we're seeing an unprecedented fishery right now. And I think we should protect it. And, you know, I'm really glad that you guys were able to get that to go through. Thanks. I, you, we'd have to do some research, but as far as I know, this is the first voluntary reduction in a fishery that any New England state has, has pretty much ever taken. Yeah, um, awesome. And so I'm really excited. I mean, I just think it, it's, I think the council should get all the credit in the world because they actually looked at it, they evaluated it, and they decided to take steps proactively. So yeah. um, I'm extremely thankful that the council um, did that because that, that's, as you know, that doesn't always happen. Okay. Um, and I was really, really pleased with how they, at the situation, and uh, we're willing to take some steps before it's mandated. Great. Well, again, I thank you uh, for taking the time and, um, you know, thanks for thanks for doing what you do. Not an easy job. And in some ways, I think it sometimes comes across as a thankless job, but uh, I think you're doing a great job and it's great to see the enthusiasm and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate you taking the time and uh, thanks for breaking it down. And again, just that's definitely a big victory for Risa. Good job there. And uh, great to have you at the helm. So moving on from that, let's uh, before we get into the reports themselves, let's announce the winners of the rat contest. So um, as you probably know, if you've been watching this thing um, over the last month or so, um, I did a contest to give away one of these rat baits um, that I make. And um, you know, I threw a couple other lures in there, basically just a photo contest. We're going to keep them going. Um, but this time... I got a lot of good photos, but I got two great ones, and it made it so difficult for me to pick who should be the winner that I decided I'm going to give away two of them. Uh, so the first one's going to go to Mike McGordy uh, for his eight and change largemouth that he took through the ice up in Central Mass. Beautiful fish, beautiful photo. Um, it just was impossible for me not to uh, not to reward him for that fish and that great pick. Um, the other one goes to James Jones, and for in this case, yeah, you know, I do have some great a great photo from him, but I mean it's almost a reward for just having a phenomenal season. This guy has been putting up crazy numbers of big pike all winter long from the Connecticut River and surrounding areas, and um, I don't know. I just felt like uh, you know he's he's always out there. He's always putting up good fish. He almost always has a smile on his face, except when he gets pulled over for having a tinted license plate cover but uh that's another story and i figure you know he deserves a rat too so i'm gonna be in contact with both of you guys about what colors you'd like and uh, get those out to you as soon as i get them painted uh, but then there were two runners up so i had sam howe who was the only guy who put in two photos trying to uh you know trying to win this thing uh both of them were holdover stripers caught from rhode island and uh definitely appreciated getting those photos and hope that he'll participate in the future so I'm going to send him this uh, Rhode Island pop. Uh, Rhode Island. I'm going to send him this Missouri um, popper. And then we had Bando Tapper, uh, who put up a couple of uh, good picks 
of uh, some holdovers caught in Boston Harbor. So I'm going to send him this Usuri Top Knock pencil and uh, you know, put some lures in guys' hands. We're going to get, uh, you know, we're going to start the season off right for these guys. And in keeping with the way things have been going month by month, uh, we're going to do another one this time. I'm going to be giving away one of these, uh, and maybe I'll do two of them, we'll see. It depends on the photos, but I'm um, going to be giving away one of these uh, Floyd Roman Nikes. And the kind of cool thing about these is that you'll definitely be one of the only guys throwing something like this. This, uh, this plug stopped being made sometime in the 1940s, and uh, I highly doubt the fish have seen too many of these. Uh, they fish somewhere between a darter and a swimmer. They get pretty deep and uh, definitely present as a big profile. Um, and something that I'm looking forward to fishing this year, and I think you will be too. Uh, we're going to keep this one open till the middle of April. Uh, I think it's going to be around the 13th of April or something like that. But I will, uh, I'll put the date up on the screen here um, so that you guys know exactly when it's going to end. But you're going to have you know five weeks to put up some good fish. And I'll be really looking forward to... Uh, seeing the fish that you guys catch. Over in Massachusetts, you know, and, and points north now at this point, um, spring is winning the battle, so we're losing ice rapidly, and that tends to happen, you know, the ice holds on for a long time, and then, you know, kind of out of nowhere, it just seems like someone came in with a big blowtorch and just, just melts it all, so still got safe ice, you know, north, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Uh, I would even be leery of some of the spots in southern New Hampshire and Vermont, but, you know, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I traveled up to Central Mass again this week and um, saw a lot of open water, and the what little ice I did see, I wouldn't be walking on. So, um, I'm calling it pretty much over in Massachusetts. I talked to Roy Leba again this week, and he sent us a video and he said he's done ice fishing, so this is going to be his first open water entry of 2022. Uh, take it away, Roy. Hey, Dave, quick check-in. Uh, here we are in March, and things are starting to switch over. There is some diehards out there here in Western Mass that are still on the ice. Um, I've given it up. I've put all my stuff away, and now it's time to switch gears and really concentrate on some of the best fishing, open water fishing, that this part of the state in Western Mass has to offer. Um, I'm talking about trout and pike. Uh, so I'm going to take full advantage of that from here until stripers show up. Um, you know, ultralight fishing, fly rod, and then the heavy guns uh, for pike and trout. I know stocking trucks have started to roll on the Southeast coast, uh, meaning Cape Cod. So it's only a matter of time before water temps throughout the state are just right and those trucks roll everywhere. Um, which will make some good good fishing whether you're a bait fisherman or artificial fisherman like myself uh, So tomorrow will be my first trip out open water uh, Please stay tuned. I'll have a re full report for you guys next week. All right, go catch them up and be safe. Thanks Thanks Roy um, Excited to see that we're going to continue this out of the ice fishing season and uh, always enjoy your insights. Thanks for the report So as we kind of get down uh, into southeastern Massachusetts and heading out toward the Cape you know, ice is gone, um, and the stocking trucks are now on the move, so a lot of the most popular places have now gotten their first shot of trout, and to nobody's surprise, the trout fishing has started to really light up. So, you know, places like Long Pond in Plymouth, or Little Pond in Plymouth, or Peters, or Hamblin, um, Cliff Pond, Little Cliff, um, and just the dozens of others that I'm not going to name uh, out on the Cape and on the approaches to the Cape are starting to give up some reliable catches. I'm uh, hearing about a lot of rainbow trout in that 12 to 20 inch range. There's some really nice fish being taken. A lot of the bigger fish are being taken on live bait. So shiners have been a really popular uh, way to get these fish. Um, but I know from experience, if you put in a little time with a jerk bait or, uh, or a Ned rig or little trout magnet, something that you can fish slow, something you can stop here and there. Um, it's going to give you a really good shot at getting some of these bigger fish. If you're more of a traditionalist and you want to throw like an Al's Goldfish or a Thomas Buoyant or something like that, you're still going to do fine. Um, I just feel like your chances of getting one of the bigger ones is it's going to be a little bit diminished, but I still think you're going to catch plenty of fish. Uh, largemouth bass fishing is now starting to light up as well. It's, you know, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Um, and um, 
Haven't seen too many big ones. I've seen fish in that one and a half to three and a half pound range more regularly. Uh, I did see one fish over five caught by a friend of mine, Mike Lucini, and uh, posted by MGC Fishing. I uh, really appreciate you guys putting up that great shot of Mike. That fish was over five. That was taken on a Vision 110. That's just a little 110 size uh, suspending jerk bait. Um, one of my favorites. And um, that's the time of year it is right now. I, this is jerk bait season. The water's still pretty cold. And uh, these fish are out, you know, looking to bulk up for the spawn. It's a great time to get a big one on a jerk bait. And we're going to rapidly move now into, um, into swim bait time. So, you know, we'll be throwing big baits here within a week or two. Um, and it looks like we got a really warm week next week, which I think is going to just fire things up. Um, I'm organizing my swim bait stuff now and uh, really looking forward to getting out there. Uh, as far as holdover action in Massachusetts goes, I really only got the news from uh, Bando there. He uh, sent me that pick today, actually. Uh, no, he sent me that pick two days ago. And um, it's sort of just the beginning. That was a Boston Harbor fish, and uh, great to see that happening. And, you know, I would guess, more than guess, I would almost guarantee that the fish in some of the estuaries on the Cape are starting to wake up now. And, um, you know, if what's happening in Rhode Island and Connecticut is any kind of an indication of what's happening in Mass, things are going to rapidly uh, fire up for stripers in the backwaters. And, um, you know, we've got a lot to look forward to. It's a great time of year. Now, as we move over into Rhode Island, um, holdover striper fishing seems to be you know, reluctantly taking center stage. Rhode Island doesn't have one of those, you know, uh, guarantee estuaries like Connecticut does. You know, Connecticut has multiples. Um, in Rhode Island, it's more, you know, it's like all the salt ponds along the South Shore. Uh, many of these deeper estuaries that dump into Narragansett Bay, um, they all have some level of, uh, of a holdover striped bass population. Um, your best chance of finding them by far is to get in there with a boat or a kayak that has a fish finder on it and just look for a pile of fish because, you know, it's not like the Housatonic where you have like a, you know, a, I don't even know what to call it, like a tribe of fish, a, you know, uh, it's, it's different. You know, these, these fisheries, these, in these smaller ponds, it's more of, uh, it's more like a traditional holdover population. It's a smaller concentration of fish. And you got to find that concentration to catch fish. Um, if you don't have a boat or if you don't have a fish finder on your yak, um, or if you're a shore pounder, the, uh, the next best thing is just to, you know, kind of incrementally cover the shoreline, fish as many of the deeper holes as you can, try to target those drop-offs and feel. Um, and you're going to feel at times that, that your jig is just bouncing through a school of fish. You have to learn to recognize what that feels like. Um, but that's a really good way to find the fish. And once you kind of figure that out and figure out where they are, you can almost feel them. Sometimes the hook will just kind of just pick their scales and you almost feel like they're turning over. Um, and that's, uh, that's an indication that the fish are there. Then it's just up to you to figure out what they might actually eat. Um, and if you're not getting bit, a little tip from me is to just downsize and downsize and downsize until you can't even throw what you're throwing. Sometimes that little tiniest thing you got will earn a strike when nothing else will. Um, but that's going on. Uh, we're definitely hearing about more freshwater fishing in Rhode Island this week, some largemouth being caught. Don't forget though that Rhode Island still has an opening day of trout season, so you can't bass, you can't fish at all actually in any, uh, in any trout stocked waters. You don't want to do that. I did it by accident a few years ago and it didn't pay off. Um, it was only a warning, but, uh, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to go down that road. So you definitely want to be cognizant of that. Uh, the other thing that's going on is that there are some codfish being caught out around Block Island, but it's, uh, you know, the guys did, if you're going to do it, you want to get on a charter boat. You don't want to go out on your own boat because it doesn't sound like there's an, like a good body of fish this year. It's more like these fish have accumulated throughout the winter on certain snags, certain little drop-offs, ledges, and wrecks. And, you know, these guys that run the charter boats, they have a endless uh, log of spots and, um, and they're basically playing musical chairs out there just to put together a catch. If you're going to go out there on your boat and hit your, you know, the tug, uh, tug spot, the cod spot that's been working for you, you know, these last few winters, I think you're going to be, I think you're going to be uh, disappointed when you head back to the dock. So head out with a pro, and I think that's going to offer you your best shot at hooking up with some cod in Rhode Island. 
And that's the story that I have for you guys in the Ocean State this week. So as we move over into Connecticut, the one thing we have to mention right off the bat is that again, we're going to you know reiterate from last week, there is no closed trout season in Connecticut anymore. Um, they did away with that this year, and the only stipulations are that all trout need to be released, and if the lake you're fishing in has its own closed season, and there are a lot of lakes that do, so make sure you check, you can only target trout until the traditional opening day. So keep those two things in mind. Don't jump into a stocked trout lake and start looking for largemouth because you could get in trouble. Um, I don't know how they're going to enforce this, but you know the law is the law, so make sure you abide by that. Um, but all that aside, uh, the reports I'm hearing are that there are a lot of happy fishermen out there catching and releasing trout throughout the entire state. You know, from the uh, from the Mill River out west to the Salmon River in the middle and all the way to the Rhode Island border. Uh, guys are having a great time. They're catching a lot of fish and they're happy as a clam releasing them. Um, also starting to see more of the sea frelons now showing up um, in local catches. Got some pictures this week of a few of them that were taken recently. So that fishery is really seem to, seeming to benefit from, uh, from the ice melting and guys being able to fish open water. Um, the other thing that's been really popular is obviously holdover striper fishing. We'll hear more about that from Max at the end, but Housatonic's been good. There's been fish caught in the Thames. There's been fish caught in some of the tributaries of the Connecticut River, and uh, some of the lesser rivers along the coastline as well are producing some fish. So that's something that you want to keep in mind for sure. And, you know, the, as the water gets warmer, those fish get crazier. You start seeing some herring, they get even crazier. So, you know, this is the time of year to start and then just... Don't take your foot off the gas. And the last thing worth talking about is just the open water pike fishing on the Connecticut River. It's still been very good, um, especially the mouths of any tributary seem to be holding fish. Um, and, you know, it's mostly males this time of year. So you're mostly going to get fish in that like 24 to 30 inch range, but you never know when mama's going to come a calling. And uh, you can get some real big fat fish. Big jerk baits and bright colors seem to be the most popular way, um, but live bait or dead bait on the bottom is also going to get you some fish. Uh, before we wrap this up, let's throw it over to Max from Fisherman's World. Let's hear what's happening out west. Trout fishing is now open year-round. There's no closed season, so you can follow your local regulations to different rivers. In our part of the state, they've stocked the Mill River pretty heavily and the Saugatuck. They should be stocking the Mianus more and the Mill again sometimes in the nearest future. Locally, the striped bass fishing on the Hoosie is steadily picking up. Guys are definitely doing better at night with soft plastics on jigs, and they're starting to hit, you know, SPs and shallower water spots. This should only improve as we move into March and into April. Guys will start throwing heavier SPs up middle towards the dam at night and Sullivan's Island. Thanks and good luck to all our anglers. Good to have you back behind the helm, Max. Uh, looking forward to another full season of, uh, of uh, reports from Max Finch and Fisherman's World. That's the reports that I have for you guys this week. I hope they were helpful. I hope you're going to get out there and, you know, utilize this information to catch yourself some fish this week. Don't forget about the lure contest. Send me your photos. If you're not a subscriber to The Fisherman Magazine, head over to thefisherman.com. Check out what we've got going on there. You'll, it'll be apparent pretty quickly. Uh, all the things that we cover, the area that we cover, and how many different fisheries um, we go through. It's a, it's a great investment. If you're a fisherman, you're not going to regret it. Check it out. If you're still interested after checking that out, at the very least, give me a like and subscribe here on YouTube and hit that little bell thing down there so you get a notification every time we post something new. Appreciate you guys, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on a podcast. Um, glad, to, glad to be here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next week. Steigercraft boats, built by people who fish our waters. Serious English choose Steigercraft for their 40 years of boat building experience right here in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Visit Steigercraft.com for a dealer near you.